strife and, and history and great men clashing and, you know, and Romeo and Juliet, you know, being bound by fate and family to such an extent that finally you make this grand sacrificial gesture on behalf of, um, you know, the woman that you love. Those models of heroism have survived. Um, in the form of first-person shooter video games, <laughs> which are our current great romantic epics. And I don't mean that in a way that's disparaging to contemporaneity at all. Like, I think that um, those games can be very beautiful and can give us opportunities to imagine great acts of heroism and sacrifice in much the same way that the Odyssey or Romeo and Juliet um, do as well. That said, um, the vast, vast majority of us are never going to be in a situation where we can jump on a grenade and save all of our buddies. Um, the vast majority of us are never going to have an opportunity for this, this heroic sacrifice that we have come to think of as the only way to have a good, short life. Like, you always hear about people, like my grandfather just died a couple of weeks ago, and he was 92, and what everyone said, and what I said, was that he lived a, a full, good life, which he did. Um, you never hear people say that about people who die at 17, or at 20, or even at 40. Um, you, and that, that, that would indicate to us that it's not possible to have a good, full life unless you were fortunate enough to live into your 90s. Well, in some ways, uh, that's true. In other ways, that's really an attack on people who are not blessed with long, uh, with long lives. Um, and I think a lot of that is because we are all trying to find a way to make a legacy, to leave something behind that will last, and I'm putting this word in quotation marks, forever. But forever is an incorrect concept, as Hazel Grace Lancaster says at one point in the novel. Um, forever is based on the idea that the sun won't blow up, um, <laughs> which it will. Um, and so we, the challenge that these, that, that these kids face in this novel is that both Hazel and Augustus are trying to figure out how to orient their lives in a way that can be positive and helpful and useful and good, both for them and for the people they love. And that's the same challenge that all of us are facing, regardless of whether we're sick. It's just that many of us are blessed with the ability not to have to think about it, um, at least until we're like 80. Um, and then you see a lot of, like I know all the old people I've known start thinking about it a lot. Um, I, for whatever reason, happen to start thinking about it earlier. So, so that's, that's the first thing that I, I'd want to say about, about this novel. Like it really was about, for me, trying to figure out the answer to that question, how do you live a heroic life? Like what constitutes a heroic, well-lived life, particularly if you don't die at 92, uh, which I hope we all do, or even old. Yeah, forget that, I hope we'll die at 400. Uh, <laughs> I started writing this story uh, in 2000 when I was working as a student chaplain at a children's hospital. For about five months I worked at a, a children's hospital counseling kids and their families um, in times of intense crisis, often when um, young people were, were dying or had, had died. And the kids I met there weren't meeting, didn't meet my expectations at all. Because I expected to meet kids who were, you know, like sad, wise-eyed creatures who knew something deep and meaningful about the secret of why we're here and like what the gift of consciousness is all about. And instead they were like completely normal teenagers. Um, and had no special insight into the meaning of life, which was a real disappointment to me. 